live and this is amanda los you are tuned into inalienable sovereignty conversations for elevation and i am super excited for our juicy juicy guest today veronica monet uh, yeah. hi amanda <laughs> i'm so glad to be here yay good to have you here um and you've been in my life in and out no for, pun for intended a for a while yeah. and uh so appreciate our connection and really excited to drop in and learn a little bit more about you and what you do and how inalienable sovereignty applies to you but i'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself to the people that do not know you like i do okay cool uh so i am a Certified sexologist and an anger management specialist. I'm also an internal family systems. That's IFS, not to be confused with family constellations. Um, informed coach, and I, I, I predominantly work with couples. And I, I take on some pretty gnarly topics, including domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse. Um, but the vast majority of the people that I work with actually are looking to have better communication skills, stop arguing, learn how to handle their anger in ways that are not destructive. So beautiful. Uh, I've got extreme outliers and then there's just, you know, the vast majority of people who are just having really uh, typical issues that tamp down their sexual joy. And that, that's kind of the the, the door through which they find me. They're like, help us with our sex life. And I go, okay, so let's talk about how you fight. And they're like, well, we don't. I go, well, that's a problem. And <laughs> <laughs> or they say, oh, well, yeah, but you know, then we say we're sorry and it's fine. I'm like, well, do you keep having the same argument over and over again? Oh, sure. Of course we do. Well, let's, let's fix that. Let's solve right. it. Nice. And I, I, have a big container for a lot of different types of sexuality at the same time i'm really committed to rebirthing the divine feminine and and part of that to me is fun, reconnecting with our sacred sexuality so uh for people who don't want to know about sacred sexuality i'm i'm not gonna you know teach them about it but a lot of people yeah. do yeah uh, and want to know what it's about and and everybody's looking for that more fulfilling ascended uh, unified experience, oh, you know, and, and more embodied. And I, I like to say that it's a very, a very interesting thing about sacred sex because we use the body to escape it. Mm. So if you really get to that point where you've merged with the divine and with your beloved, there's a way in which you're actually having an out of body of experience, oh. which is unlike doing psychedelics. No doubt, no doubt. Yeah. I've had the, I've had both of those experiences, and they're quite. Mm -hmm quite lovely and i just want to you know some people might not know what a sexologist is unless you even you know you can just break it down somebody who studies yeah. sex but i would i know that i misunderstood you briefly um so maybe you could share a little bit about yes well, uh, it, what that it's, is it's easy for people to get confused because i have a background as a high-end escort and so people think oh you became a sexological body worker no i didn't lots and lots of props to that field yeah. um, i actually know the man who founded it um joseph kramer I was sitting right next to him when he came up with the idea in san francisco nice. i was you're really going to teach people how to touch people sexually and get paid for it and it, they're going to get certified in the state of california well now there's certifications all over around the world amazing but that's not what i do uh i stopped uh touching people's bodies uh in 2004 and believe me, I brought sacred prostitution and sacred sexuality to my journey as an escort. Mm -hmm. And I'm still very um, passionate about sex worker rights. And um, recently was in San Francisco, it's when Scott Wiener introduced uh, legislation that uh, actually makes it possible for sex workers to report their own uh, rapes and sexual assaults, if you can believe that we're still trying to do that yeah. so that's that's still very much a part of who i am but no i i don't touch people now <laughs> so, yeah except i give hugs i give hugs yeah right hugs are so, so important yeah so sexologist just you know it's a i've got a certification but really what what counts the most is that vast experience around sexuality 
as well as the education so that I don't just generalize from my own personal experiences, but my own personal experiences encompass all races and socioeconomic categories mm -hmm. over the course of 15, 17 years. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really valuable. Yeah, who wants is. to learn from somebody who just read a book? <laughs> well, that that's a little, <laughs> a little bit of red flag. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I love that we're diving into this topic because the United States, very puritanical roots. And uh, I know that uh, there are things that have seemed perfectly natural to talk about for me, even though I was raised from super, super puritanical roots. Um, but why, you know, maybe you could share a little bit with people that have you know, they're curious, they're maybe open minded, but they may have had an upbringing and a culture that has tabooed sex. Yeah. Why, why is it so important to understand and enjoy sexuality in general, healthy sexual sexuality, and in particular, sacred sexuality? Great question. By the way, I was I was born into a uh, right wing doomsday Christian religious cult. So um, I, I know a lot about me. I read the Bible from cover to cover when I was 12. I kept hoping to have some kind of a spiritual awakening and it never came. I just got revolted um, by the dogma that was being shoved in my throat. And eventually I left the church when I was 19. Um, I became very rebellious uh, against the sexual proscriptions prescriptions being that's something that's prohibited yeah um and that's where i first started getting all my experience i, I became very very experienced um sexually but in a really frustrating unfulfilling way so i, I experienced a lot of what i think a lot of uh, cisgender women do of date rapes and mm. and orgasmia and just you know like why I, i'm doing this to feel loved but there's not much else in it for me and I really had quite a journey. And I'm an incest survivor and also a three-time rape survivor. Mm. So it was just way in having to reclaim my body and my pleasure. You know, the way I look at spirituality and sexuality is that they're intertwined. I don't see a lot of difference. If I'm meditating to raise my kundalini in order to be able to channel and absorb and, and hear divine wisdom, it's a very similar process to when I'm raising my Kundalini and uh, making love with my beloved. There, there's still this way in which I'm surrendering to the divine. Yeah. If you treat sex as a mechanical thing, and unfortunately in Western culture, we've got a lot of focus away from the energetic and towards the mechanical technique. Yes. <laughs> and, and most sexologists teach technique. Look, I got technique out of the bed here. You know, anything you want to know, I can, I can tell you things your doctor has no clue about, but um, that's not really where the action's at. Action's is no. really in your, your chakras and your Kundalini energy, which, you know, is at the base of your spine. And also in this, this, this merging with the divine, which is really about surrendering. And at the same time, ironically enough, you will achieve some sovereignty. So one of the things that Western culture does to animals in order to subdue them and domesticate them is they castrate them. They get rid of their sexuality. And um, in a lot of ways, I believe that monotheism, which is you know the big three, Judaism and Christianity and Islam, all have very, very strict ideas around sexuality. And particularly yeah. women's sexuality. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we're seeing such a huge backlash right now to women's freedoms in the United States. Um, but there's some of that taking place around the world, and some of it never really left. You know, I was just listening to some really depressing podcasts about what's happening in uh, Afghanistan with the women there. And it's, it just makes my heart just scream and cry. I think it's so important for us to realize that our sexuality is our connection to the divine. And it's also our connection to our sovereignty. 
you take that away, somebody starts controlling that, shaming you for that, um, you become kind of half a person. Yeah. And you lose so much access to your intuition and your personal power and your personal knowing. So it's, I think it's crucial. It's crucial that we have bodily autonomy. It's also yeah. crucial that we have sexual sovereignty. And, you know, those, those should be absolutely positively sacred. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. If we go back before monotheism, of course, we're going to find that there were peaceful agrarian cultures that practiced sacred sexuality. Yeah. That ancients knew that sex was a doorway to the divine. If you go to those ancient temples in India, there's sex all over the walls. There, there is no separation. Yeah. But if we take the sex away from people, we also take their ability to connect with the divine on their own. And we start setting ourselves up as a power structure over them. And um, I'm just so totally against that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you touched on so, so much in what you just shared and uh, a couple of things come to mind. I just uh, recently, I just barely finished uh, listening on Audible uh, to the alphabet versus the goddess and uh and then also the immortality key and the ties uh between women being empowered uh historically there's been scientific uh findings that's been corroborated over and over again shared in both of these texts uh that women uh, were the they were they they had sexual they they their sexual power was honored and it was a sacred thing uh and it was it was a power and it was a mystical power and they helped do a lot of initiations right they guided the initiations for the masculine to connect with source and they were the keepers and makers and servers of the sacred psychedelics they found that the original eucharist was um was kaikion which has ergot in it which is an lsd like psychedelic um so these things that helped connect us with source our sexuality um altered consciousness yeah. these were all being practiced and uh and then <clears throat> something happened there's a lot of different theories which i won't go into but then all of a sudden that changed and women were demonized their sexuality was cut off demonized altered states were ill you know demonized sex drugs rock and roll you know music uh and and imagery demonized yes. these self expressions and and the the first texts about insanity like talking about people going mad started coming after that so there's this disconnection from source this this illegality of the individual connecting with spirit on their own and needing an intercessor of a mm -hmm. church to come in and you know put the kibosh on all these ecstasies these ways of be going beyond ourselves <clears throat> and 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 this growing insanity mental illness addiction depression anxiety and we know it's been getting worse and worse yes uh so I, it's like it's coincidental but but also and mm, not no. <laughs> no no i don't think it's i don't think it's coincidental at all i mean you know what the the, the western culture as it and I, I don't know if I would even limit it to Western culture. But, you know, the dominant paradigm on this planet right now is one about power and resource. And it's not about community and it's not about uh, sharing and uplifting and helping each other. And, and we don't actually have to just look to humans to find this contrast because we've got two of our closest primate relatives on this planet that we can look at and they have two very very different systems there's the bonobos and the chimpanzees mm -hmm. and the chimpanzees have all the afflictions that we have they have infanticide rape domestic violence murder and war jane goodall documented a four-year war that was just so brutal 
and it was tribalism. It was it was brother against brother. Um, they polarized and they fought each other over resources. And and one of the resources that chimpanzees fight over is sex. Yeah. So then you look at the bonobos, and the bonobos are the peaceful agrarian cultures. They're a reflection of what human history also contains elements of. Yeah. Unfortunately, so just to summarize about the bonobos, one of the things I love to say, it's, it's factually true, but most people don't word it this way, is that they are governed by a um, council of lesbian grandmothers. Mm. Um, so and they're actually bisexual but they are older females and they engage in sex with each other that's what creates a really tight bond and camaraderie with in their um, tribe but the males enjoy unlimited sex and there is no rape murder infanticide domestic violence or war in bonobo land and Franz de Waals, a leading primatologist who studied both chimpanzees and bonobos, and uh, I've interviewed him, have a lot of respect for him, read quite a few of his books. I love one of the things that he says, which is that we have this, um, this sense that somehow or another, our innate nature is deficient, and we need to have the moral overlay of religion to, to make sure that we don't do terrible things. Mm. But the truth is we find altruism and morality in the animal kingdom, mm -hmm. but it just depends on how it's organized. If it's really organized towards a lack and this grasping for power and resources, then you're probably gonna see violence. Mm. But if there is an attitude of sharing and the bonobos share everything, um, they share food, they share sex, they share a lot of affection. Just to me, that's a much more preferable system. Yeah. So, and and it's within our reach. We, but we'd have to change the way that we think, and we'd have to be more concerned about the welfare of everybody instead of yeah. just ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been so. Uh, you know, survival has been so woven into obeying the laws of the oppressor. Oppressor. So you know it's it's epigenetic it's generational it's you know if you're you're one of us or you're one of them like it's traditional it's like it's just yeah. it's woven into our our cellular memory of how it is uh and it's it's it can be really hard um to break out of that for some people oddly enough i grew up mormon i grew up very very uh repressed sexually definitely you know it was demonized and i uh, didn't feel any sense of em empowerment over my body um had a lot of physical and emotional and mental symptoms at the time but as it was like the moment i realized like oh this is i'm not mormon this isn't my thing i i have a, a, my own connection that is independent it's not reliant on this religious structure. Uh, I let go of all of that sexual uh, repression and, and shame. And I don't know how I just lucky or, or my astrology or whatever, but um, it's been a beautiful experience in my life and the sacred came in uh, as a part of that to, you know, and, and was very obvious, you know, having these altered states uh from deep connection um uh, but i know that it's it's so woven in to, generationally and i'm curious how you support people in unraveling that and also you know how do people like what what why do they come to you you know like if they've got all this shame right like how would they take the leap to wow. to to even know that that's a possibility you know how what's maybe maybe that's too big of a question to no, put on no, your shoulders but no, it's, it's not too big of a question i actually have an answer for that of course everybody's in the individual and various people come for various different reasons but i think the fact that i am a former sex worker who's out and unapologetic about that is helpful because oh, yeah. people feel like 
well, I can tell her anything. Now that was actually the truth when I was working as an escort. Men told me all kinds of stuff uh, that they would have never told, you know, their lawyers, brokers, wives, children, therapists. So I, I'm used to receiving um, a lot of heavy truths that people yeah. are terrified of having discovered. Um, and I'm really good at keeping secrets. So having a track record of that and you know a history of that, I think is comforting to people. I think also some of them may feel superior to me at times, you know, if they do, I, that's unfortunate for them. But it might give them a sense of safety to go ahead and take that leap. And once they find out who I am, and they're actually sitting across from me, whether on video or in my office, they have an experience of somebody who really is able to walk or talk. I don't just say, oh, yeah, well, whatever you've been through, you know, I can handle it. I can actually be grounded and present for them. Okay. And that comes from years of experience. It also comes from the fact that I've lived through so much. Yeah. So. And, I, and I, I also make no secret of the fact that I'm not just a domestic violence survivor, I'm a domestic violence perpetrator in recovery. So just outing myself around that one thing gives people this sense that she's, she's with me in this. Mm -hmm. She's not over me, she's not trying to be superior to me. And yet she's got a lot of information and expertise that I need. Beautiful. So that's, that's really how I roll. Beautiful. That's so beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's bringing up a lot, like, you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for a lot of shit flinging from people that aren't soothed and comforted and in need of that compassionate space holding. I know that my own sense of compassion, I, I did ch child welfare for 11 years and realized these children that I'm interviewing are likely to grow up and do the same things to their children that are being done to them. And mm -hmm. so I've found myself in, in places of really having compassion for everyone, you know, because that's how we heal in the unified consciousness. Yes. You can't have just a perpetrator, you know, if you want to get out of your victim story, you have to release the perpetrator and, uh, and so I've held the space and for people and gotten shit myself. And I don't even think it's nearly as edgy as what you're doing. And I'm curious if you've experienced that. It's like Jesus, you know, who was, who was he, not necessarily a sexologist, but he was holding space for all of the, yeah. the people who were, who were kind of just treated and seen as the, the dredge of society and uh but holding space and holding the light and that just takes incredible strength and i'm just curious about your journey with that well first of all thanks for asking about that i i feel seen by you i really do and that feels good um yeah it's it it can be difficult i mean um sometimes uh, as recently as yesterday even you know clients project a lot onto me that uh, is antagonistic and hostile. Um, I feel a couple of things. One, I've been in them. Mm. I've, I've done all that. I've been in my therapist's office telling them that I don't trust them and, and, and trying to you know, play games with them. And there's so much psychology that goes on between a coach and their client or a therapist and their client. Um, it helps to have some background in that some education in that but it also really helps to have been on both sides of it yeah so that i can i can empathize and go well you know i've actually done that i know i know what i was feeling in my body when i was doing that and they're not me i'm not going to just project all my stuff onto them but i'm going to use it as kind of a template to find some footing here so that i don't become reactive yeah um, and as an anger uh, management coach, I, I can't afford to react. <laughs> After all, my old, my old reputation is, so I, sometimes my ego gets in there. It's like, I'm not going to go there with them. Um, but mostly what I'm doing is, is not going into ego, but practicing what I'm learning, still learning. Uh, even though I'm trained, I'm still learning. I just took a um, 
my uh, weekend class again in IFS. Uh, it's a beautiful practice. And I want to share a little bit about that uh, for your viewers because it is so much about our sovereignty. And so the premise of IFS is that we have subpersonalities. And some of them are what we call protectors. They might be firefighters, they might be managers. Managers are really trying to keep you on track. And you know, they tend to be a little bit dry and logical. Firefighters are, you know, this, they throw caution to the wind. They're just here to protect you. And they may do some very destructive things in order to try to protect you. And then we have exiles, which are our inner children. They've gotten stuck in points of trauma and they're, they're in a lot of pain. And that, that's who the firefighters are trying to protect. So self, what is self? Self in a lot of ways sounds a little bit godlike. I, I personally don't see it that way. Some people do see self as, oh, that's God. Some people see it as that's part of them. I see self as part of me. I experience it as part of me. Uh, and when I'm helping my clients to connect with self, I feel like I'm helping them connect to a part of them. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe in a higher consciousness and I definitely value having a connection um, with that higher consciousness. But my self has sovereignty. It can only have sovereignty if my subpersonalities are working with me as partners. But here's what happens. If I'm not conscious about this internal drama, then those subpersonalities take over and they start to do things that might be um, bad for the people out here and bad for me. So a subpersonality would be the one who commits domestic violence. That one feels that you either hurt or be hurt. That one's coming from a place of tremendous fear and oftentimes has, in my case, I saw there was just two th examples. My mother's getting hurt. My father's doing the hurting. Which, which one do I want to do? I, well, I don't want to get hurt. So I picked the, the other one. But I also have the side that gets hurt. And so I've flip-flop between those two. And when I work, work with domestic violence clients, I see they have the codependent part that's going to get hurt and submit to that um, abuse. And then they've got the perpetrator part. If we start to get to know those different parts, oh. then we can find out how they're protecting us. Yeah. So we actually want to befriend them, ask them why they're doing what they're doing, what they're afraid of, how, how it is they're trying to help us. And we love them. Yeah. We love those parts. Mm -hmm. And when we do, when we see them, we understand them and we love them, they quiet down and they start to give us some space. And in that space, Self is amazing. It's creative. It's compassionate. It's confident. It's calm. It's curious. And that's the place you want to come from. Mm -hmm. because That's the place that has true power. Indeed. I love that. It's so aligned. Like I said, I, I uh, when you mentioned, I, I know a few people uh, who work with IFS. And so I did a little research. It is so aligned with the subconscious accessory patterning work that I do that curiosity, the really being, being bringing love, kindness and compassion into these parts that would normally get labeled as bad, wrong, the fucked up part of me, the saboteur, you know, that we end up somebody abused that part of us. And then we end up becoming the perpetrators thinking that it's damaged or the bad, the weak, shameful, and bringing that love and compassion and curiosity is so key. I love, it's very, very aligned. I love that you bring that into your work. Um, and how can people that are interested in bringing healing and bringing the sacred to their sexuality, bringing healing to these really tabooed, uh, stigmatized, experiences because i know so many people have had them uh you know in some way or been exposed how can they connect with you and get on your your train <laughs> absolutely thanks for asking about that too and, and i just want one caveat i've used labels here today perpetrator survivor you know um not everybody likes those labels so the main thing is are you in pain mm. and and most of us are. This is a really trying time to be on planet Earth. No. And finding some clarity and, and, and a place inside that's calm 
and self-nurturing is it's it's essential for every single one of us mm -hmm. so you don't have to claim any of the labels that that i've thrown out there today i do that to destigmatize mm -hmm. just as just as i i wore the, happily wore the the word whore while i was a sex worker I scarlet love, letter <laughs> I, I, i'm all about destigmatizing things beautiful but but that's my political axe to grind that's the path mm -hmm. i'm on and um you find what's comfortable for you but if you go over to my website you're gonna find my blog you're gonna find um a library of podcasts that you can uh, join for like 47 dollars for lifetime uh i've got an online training uh, that you can enroll in, which also gives you access to email coaching from me. And you can always upgrade to to one on one coaching via um, in person or video. Beautiful. And you can just reach out to me and schedule a first session. Um, awesome. So we can get acquainted. I, I, you know, we can talk for 10 minutes over the phone, but I, I really just prefer let's do that first session and see yeah. that yeah. I want you to know about my free gift. Well, what what is your website? Oh, that would be helpful. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot of different URLs driving to this one site. So you can do veronicamonet.com. You can do the exquisite partnership formula.com. Um, the one I use is the shamefreezone.com. The shamefreezone.com. I love it. And then what's your gift? It's called the exquisite partnership formula. Look, I just talked about IFS and how we have all these subpersonalities. The whole goal of IFS is to achieve a partnership with your subpersonalities. We also want partnership in our personal relationships. Uh -huh. So this is what I'm all about is this integration and this, this um, expression of we are here on behalf of each other. Uh -huh. So the exclusive partnership formula has got some very concrete tools. I've got five steps to asserting a very powerful no that will draw your partner closer to you. I've also got how to take the perfect time out. That's gonna create more harmony in your home. And um, a cute little game that my partner and I invented, it's called Show Me Your Movie. And it's all about building empathy for each other. Mm, I love it. It sounds amazing and so helpful. And remind people how to get it, the shame-free zone. No, shame no, it's- the shamefreezone.com uh, it'll pop okay. up right there on the page oh, beautiful. if you want to download it beautiful thank you so much veronica thank you for sharing your wisdom your compassion your vulnerability your transparency all of it is so valuable and necessary and i know you're doing great work in the world and uh for all of you tuning in sending you the love the compassion for whatever shame whatever pain you've got uh, we're here to serve your inalienable sovereignty. You can tune in same time, same place. And uh, until we get to connect again, you, Veronica, and you out in Cyberland, may the source be with you. Mm.